Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this SPE Tech Talk with Halliburton. I'm your host, Joe Sinnott, coming to you live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And regardless of where you are tuning in from today, you're likely aware of the energy industry's rapidly expanding focus on CCUS, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. But storing CO2 underground is not without some unique risks and regulations. In particular, companies designing CCS wells must address the challenge of maintaining the integrity of annular barriers within highly corrosive environments. That being said, we're joined today by Halliburton to discuss the importance of proper material selection and best practices to design and place annular barriers for long-term carbon dioxide storage. And although we'll be talking about the critical role of downhole barriers over the next 30 minutes, our goal here on SPE Tech Talks is to minimize barriers between you, the audience, and our technical experts. So please take advantage of this live broadcast by using the comments section to inject your questions and comments into today's conversation. And our guest will address as many of those questions as possible later in the show. Two more great ways to interact with today's broadcast are by one, letting us know where in the world you're watching from, and two, answering today's audience poll question, which asks whether your company is developing plans for construction of CO2 storage wells. Answer A for yes, B for no, and feel free to add any extra color that you'd uh, care to inject, so long as, of course, you're uh, approved for doing so uh, with your company. All that being said, we'll take a look at the results later on in the show with our guest. And speaking of our guest, let's go ahead and introduce Misty Rowe, Global Account Manager for Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage with Halliburton. Misty has worked with Halliburton for the last 12 years in a variety of leadership roles in technology, program, and product management. She has authored many technical publications and holds several U.S. and international patents in multiple industries. Misty earned the Houston Business Journal's Woman to Watch Award due to her involvement in driving diversity initiatives within Halliburton and across the oil and gas industry. Dr. Rowe holds a PhD in applied chemistry from Colorado School of Mines and is joining us today from Houston, Texas. With that, hello, Misty, and welcome to SPE Good morning. Tech Talk. Thank you for the introduction. All right. Well, thank you for being here today, Misty. And if you would, could you kick us off by giving a little background on underground storage of carbon dioxide and in particular, why it requires barriers that you know can lead to long-term integrity given the, the downhole conditions that are unique to these applications? It's a great question to start, start us off. And Halliburton Cementing has been providing sustainable barriers for the construction of oil and gas wells for more than 100 years. In fact, the word sustainable is a part of our value proposition because every barrier we place downhole must have long-term integrity. Fundamentally, carbon storage wells are really no different. They require us to place a barrier in the annulus of the well that withstands those downhole conditions and, and most importantly, the injection operations that are going to occur. And from that aspect, we've leveraged our well construction experience from the past, including enhanced oil recovery, acid injection, and geothermal, and extended those best practices to several of our customers who are working down their path of decarbonizing their activities, and especially employing CCUS in those operations. Now, arguably, the biggest difference between conventional oil and gas wells and a CO2 storage well are things like operational timeframes and regulatory requirements that they're held to. And when you think of oil and gas, you may think of a well uh, on the order of 20 to 30 years. In the case of CCUS, our customers are developing their well plans, and they're looking at 20 to 30 years of harsh cyclic injections just to place the CO2. And after those injection operations, regulations require 50 plus years, even 100 years in some locations to monitor, ensure that CO2 is in the place that we plan for it. So really, that's why it's critical to select the right barrier for these applications and ensure those barriers have been tailored to uphold the integrity over the entire life cycle of that well. Great. All right. So you answered the why there, Misty, that again, if nothing else from a timing standpoint, right, you know, we're looking at uh, lots of activity in the first couple of decades and then decades after that. So let me ask you this then, 
what factors, what unique factors do you have to consider? Does Halliburton have to consider when you're getting ready to design these specific carbon storage wells? Sure. So with CCUS becoming more commercially viable, uh, material selection and well design are really the critical components to ensure those annular barriers are robust enough to withstand those dec decades of injection cycles. The first crucial objective is really to utilize operational best practices to ensure well bore integrity. And I can't highlight that enough, so I'm going to say that again. Our, our crucial objective is to utilize operational best, uh, best practices to ensure that well bore integrity. For example, we want to make sure that the well bore is sufficiently cleaned before placement of the scent and uh, that we have good cement, uh, centralization that casing. Taking both of those steps allows us to meet our objective to maximize the radial or annular coverage with high quality cement that meets the really strict regulatory requirements. In many of these CCUS projects, we've actually supported uh, wells that are being constructed in depleted zones. These require proactive planning with our customers to minimize lost circulation events. Uh, reciprocation and ro rotation of the pipe, along with proper spacer design, ensure the well bore is prepared effectively for cement placement. So all that happens before we actually put the cement in. Um, Additionally, many of our customers are employing two-stage operations. That allows us to um, ideally maximize annular fluid separation in the well bore and give us ourselves really good, uh, high-quality cement. Halliburton offers uh, our Fidela stage cementer and OBEX compression packers for those operations. And that allows us to increase our ability to lift or bring cement all the way to the surface. That helps us meet or our customers meet regulatory requirements and actually provides a secondary barrier, which reduces risk of well bore integrity loss in the future. Secondly, it's critical to tailor the barrier for elasticity. So this helps with dynamic operations where there's big fluctuations in temperatures and pressures uh, when our CO2 is being injected. Injection causes a significant amount of stress on that well bore and those annular barriers that have been placed. These stresses can damage the cement, ultimately leading to microannuli. That allows for a path for gas to flow outside of our planned storage zone. So not something that we're really trying to design against. And finally, CCS wells must be constructed to reduce the risk of chemical alteration. Using these best practices, all of these best practices really helps us ensure we are building and designing a competent, corrosion resistant barrier and that it can be placed successfully over the planned injection zone and to surface. Great. All right. Well, thank you for all that information. I think in your answer, Misty, multiple times you talked about the importance of best practices, adhering to best practices. So I want to take this moment to remind our audience that our audience best practices here on SPE Tech Talks involves you asking questions, offering your feedback. That's why we're here. That's why we do these lives. So Take full advantage, ask your questions, and Misty will get to as many of them as possible later in the show so that you get as much value out of this conversation as possible. That being said, I've still got plenty of my own questions, Misty, and and, and I want to build on one thing you said towards the end of your prior uh, answer, and that is about you know dealing with corrosion, right? Uh, I know in prior episodes of Tech Talks with Halliburton, we've talked about the properties of Portland cements and some of the, the limitations and the considerations. So can you talk a little bit about the, the interplay between you know, corrosion and typical you know, Portland cement barriers and, and how Halliburton uh, is addressing those potential concerns, particularly with CCS wells? Yeah, of course. And that's an interesting question. But let me first level set to a comment that you just made, right? Mm -hmm. It is important to understand that Portland cements are one of the most widely used materials for construction in the world. That includes construction of buildings, roads, and in our case, oil and gas wells. And unfortunately, it's the presence of water that really complicates the long-term storage of carbon dioxide. Water present in the well bore, in the formation, or even in the small pores of the cement can react. Uh, and when that water is mixed with CO2 under the right conditions, it reacts to form carbonic acid. Now, it is well known, it's out there in the literature that Portland cement comes in contact, when it comes in contact with uh, carbonic acid, that it naturally... Occurring, comp uh, occurring components in that material react and undergo a reaction called carbonation. And some folks might call that alteration. Over time, that carbonation reaction leads to a decrease in the matrix pH, leading to chemical alteration of the cement sheath. And that's all over time. Um, 
permeability and mechanical properties then can be affected because a combination of those insoluble and soluble byproducts that are formed are chemically different than your initial Portland cement. So what you were initially designing with. To complicate the situation even more, if free water is present and the alteration reaction persists, that cement sheath may degrade, again, forming flow paths that I talked about before. This is a, a time dependent reaction and it's a pressure and temperature dependent reaction. So if proper cementing practices are, are employed and the cement sheath is designed with adequate elasticity and corrosion resistant, we can significantly minimize the re risk of that reaction and minimize the risk of loss of wellbore integrity. That's really why Halliburton works proactively with our customers. We want to understand their operations early in the process. That allows us to take a purposeful approach when we're designing and selecting these barriers for CO2 storage. Got it. So can you can you talk a little bit more about that approach? So, you know, you mentioned your customers working with them, you know, so so what is Halliburton's approach to selecting uh, you know, the, the right co corrosion resistant barriers in these specific uh, CO2 environments, now that you've explained why we have to deal with them in the first place, some of the chemistry behind it. So again, how, you know, how do you work with your customers on, on making those decisions? Now? Yeah, that's, and there, and there's different approaches out there, but I think uh, the key is to really highlight the fact that there's, there's no one size fits all solution because each design is unique. And because of that, Halliburton is taking a collaborative approach with our customers early in their CCS projects to understand their waste streams, to understand the subsurface properties of their storage sites and their injection plans so that we design the right barrier for their operations. Based on those technical inputs and a strong risk analysis approach, we focus on developing slurries with a high degree of chemical and mechanical stability by minimizing opportunities for carbonation reactions and meeting our uh, clients' commercial requirements, because that's going to be key. To reduce the risk of carbonation alteration in the sheath, we leverage really three main design practices. The first is to remove Portland from the cement slurry design. If there's no Portland in the design, then the risk of the sheath undergoing carbonation is eliminated. Now, clearly non-Portland solutions come at a premium, and we're aware of that. So where they are not commercially viable with our customers, we tailor the slurry to reduce the Portland cement, therefore lessening the components and they, that may react with that carbonic acid that's available in the well. We found it's important to select supplementary materials and their additives and additives that um, are carefully uh, selected so that they don't accelerate the carbonation reaction, but still yield required performance. Second uh, is the modification of those slurries uh, with additives like latex and resin that actually help reduce that permeability piece. So help that infiltration of water. This ensures less uh, fluid and gas penetration into the barrier and minimizes the amount of carbonation that can occur. We also employ particle packing techniques. Again, that's to yield less pore space. Less pore space provides less space for that water to sit in and reduces the opportunity for the reaction to occur. We find it's imperative to reduce water content as a whole in the slurry design. We recognize this can be challenging in weak formations that require low density cements. So employing other additives or even foaming uh, our solutions can actually help meet those fracture gradient requirements. Finally, it's imperative to design the barrier to withstand dynamic operations. And I've talked about this a couple of times now. It might be easier to relate this to why you put shock absorbers on a car. A road with hazards like potholes can put you under significant stresses on, on the vehicle. The shocks um, are there to really absorb that constant change along the intended path. We use pure resins, composites of cement and resin and other elastomers in our blends to do the same. They're there to absorb that induced stress in the injection of the CO2 on that cement that helps us to enhance the elasticity of the cement and reduces the risk of long-term mechanical damage. All right, so I think, Misty, I think I have a picture of, of a lot of the different ingredients and considerations and things you would discuss with your with your clients. Could you boil that down to some of the specific barriers now that Halliburton is using? You, you know, you, you, how do you use all these ingredients to boil them down to a couple products, you know, a couple specific barriers now that you can pump for 
uh, clients. Can you share some some of your the final products, if you will, that uh, that are going out the door these days? Of course, and and that is the challenge, right? We are continually evolving as we learn in this space, uh, and we do, we're doing that alongside of our customers, really to meet their needs. Halliburton offers a tiered portfolio of materials for CO two resistant barriers. Our top tier products show the lowest technical risk of carbonation because they have zero Portland cement in their composition. Our first non-Portland solution is a fully plastic system. It's called Wellock Resin. It's based on an epoxy resin chemistry, which is highly elastic and has very, very low or, or next to no permeability. Because of its high chemical resistance, Halliburton has employed resin systems in CCS wells already and a range of applications, including chemical injection and disposal wells, along with abandoned plugs. Thermalux cement system is our second non-Portland solution. It's a calcium aluminate phosphate cement system with a very low permeability as well. This system has been applied in a wide range of high temperature uh, environments, including geothermal wells construction for many, many decades. In addition to its high thermal stability, the Thermalux system shows good corrosion resistance, making it ideal for use in wells that have high degrees of hydrogen disulfide and, of course, CO2. This system can be tailored with mechanical property modifiers to enhance elasticity and has been employed in CCS well construction already. We understand non-Portland solutions may not fit every customer's needs. So we're excited to announce the commercialization of our next tier corrosion resistant cement system. That's called Corrosolock. Corrosolock is a modified Portland blend with resin, which can be referred to as a composite. We tailor the cement component of the composite based on all of those best practices that I talked about before. We reduce the Portland and as much water as possible. Then we supplement that blend with non-reactive materials to meet performance requirements. We then blend a specified amount of our proprietary well lock resin to reduce permeability. By incorporating the resin into the design, we provide significant enhancement to elasticity and shear bond. Both are critical for that cyclic injection operations in CCS wells. Finally, our next tier product is our Corrosisim system, which we've had in our portfolio for many years. It's a Portland-based cement system designed to lessen the chemical alteration caused by CO2. I'm sure you've guessed that the Corrosisim system is the Portland-based slurry employed in the Corrosal Lock composite that I just talked about. It's important to note that lab simulated CO2 environments testing shows chemical alteration is present in our corrosive cement system. Though it has reduced carbonation in, the com in comparison to a conventional Portland design, the presence of Portland components still allows for that reaction to occur. It's the rate of the reaction that can occur uh, as little as days or hundreds of years. And that's all dependent on chemical composition and then ultimately your downhole environmental factors that are uh, present in your CCUS wells. All right. Well, Misty, you have set the stage here. I think you've given us all a primer on the importance of barriers in these uh, CO2 storage situations. However, however, as trusting as I am and as stellar as your background is, I know in our audience we have some skeptics out there and they're wondering... How do you know? How, how do you know that this stuff works? How do you test this stuff out? How do you simulate these environments? In fact, I think we just got a question in here from uh, 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 Bpin Jane. How do you test your CO2 resistant materials, like having reactors that work under downhole conditions? And what testing have you done compared to Portland cement? Do you see degradation of Portland cement in weeks or months? A lot of questions in there, but I think that the overarching question that I have at least is, how do you know? How, how do you test this stuff out, Misty? Yeah, and that's a great discussion point. Lots of questions out there today. And we've been working diligently in our labs to quantify those effects of alteration, um, multiple cores on each of those samples, whether it be a Portland or a non-Portland solution. And we take and we cure and then we analyze those by placing in, in autoclave chambers, uh, as, as was suggested in the question. So samples are first either immersed in uh, water um, they're placed in a chamber above the water or they're taste tested in a cell where water has not been added. The, our goal there is to mimic all the conditions where carbon or carbonic acid could form. Uh, again, so that would be uh, submersed in a water above the water, which would be in a, um, a gaseous water phase or completely dry system. 
the cells are then heated uh, under pressure and that allows us to get our CO2 up to supercritical conditions, which is what we will see in the injection of CO2 in CCS wells. After exposure, times can be um, one day of exposure to many months of exposure. Uh, we do multiple pressures and temperatures, and that temperature and pressure is then removed to carefully ensure those samples are not inadvertently damaged by the process. So we don't want to damage the samples and then analyze them because that will provide uh, kind of false negatives and false positives. This method is really described as a static exposure because we're keeping a constant CO2 pressure. We can also flow CO2 through these cores, which is described as a dynamic exposure. And we have capability in our labs to do that. And we're doing quite a bit of testing there. We, or Halliburton, employs this method to mimic downhole conditions in CO2 environments. To date, there is no standardized methodology required by regulations. We see this as our best way to mimic those downhole conditions. So samples are then analyzed before and after exposure to measure the degree of alteration and determine if there is a variance in permeability and mechanical properties that may increase um, under risk of, of wellbore integrity or, or, or increased risk of wellbore integrity. So just comment one, on, on one more thing. Uh, we have tested a wide range of materials, everything from conventional Portlands to composites to um, more uh, non-Portland solutions. Uh, all dependent on uh, the alteration effect is, is dependent really on the composition uh, and of course those environmental conditions. Uh, you can see alteration in as little as less than a day in, in, in some of the conventional cohort Portlands to very little alteration at all um, on our Corosa lock system and then next to no uh, alteration on the, on the non-Portland solutions as well. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, of course, to our audience for, uh, again, sharing a bit of your skepticism and, and asking how we know, how, how we know that this stuff uh, actually works. That being said, I want to revisit a question that we asked of our audience uh, earlier on the broadcast, uh, where, Misty, we asked them whether their companies were exploring or planning or developing plans, at least, for the construction of CO2 storage wells. It looks like the majority of answers were yes, that, that a lot of companies are exploring this. Is that what you expected to see? What, you know, what are you seeing out there? Are you surprised by this? Can you shed a little bit of light on, on the trends that you're experiencing in our industry right now in terms of uh, planning for these CO2 storage wells? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm actually not surprised at all. I mean, I think uh, with uh, technologies getting better um, and more commercially viable, CCUS is definitely an interest point for many of our conventional oil and gas customers, but also for a significant amount of, of kind of new uh, customers that are coming into the market. I, from a, a CCUS side and definitely on the cementing side, lots of interest here. Um, mostly that's because of previous work that's been done in the past on an enhanced oil recovery, which utilizes CO2. And then also uh, these customers, uh, you know, pushes to decarbonize their footprints and, and really reduce their, their carbon footprint in, in their own operations. Got it. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I guess maybe building on that question, Misty, you know, a lot of, a lot of our audience is going to be familiar with obviously conventional wells. You talked about that uh, a little bit at the beginning of the episode. So I actually, I want to segue to a question we got from Jacob. So he talks about existing well bores. He says, uh, how do we protect existing well bores in fields where we want to convert to CO2 storage? So can you talk a little bit about that, you know, balancing of those, those two worlds, Misty? Sure. Yeah. So I think when uh, we're looking at repurposing uh, or, or, or reutilizing wells that are in a field, you know, you think about, you have to think about it as two different places, right? You need to talk about uh, all the wells that may be in an existing field um, and understanding their integrity uh, of those wells. It's generally very difficult to um, recognize if you have all of the pertinent information there. So folks will probably go back in and, and review uh, the integrity of the cement that's there, um, just as importantly, the integrity of the casing that's there and understand that, that subsurface formation uh, knowledge. Uh, the second piece is around, you know, repurposing, right? I think there's 
not a general uh, recommendation in, in the industry to repurpose wells without a, a good deal of the knowledge that I was just suggesting. Um, we do offer well integrity and design review um, analysis. The whole goal is uh, you, to utilize a risk management tool that um, uses a checklist to qualify and, or, or um, disqualify wells for conversion or monitoring purposes. Uh, but I think, you know, the key is to understand if we're placing a CCOS well uh, in a field uh, and there will be injection in that field, uh, do we know where all the wells are that have been placed? Do we understand what operations they, they have undergone? And, and today, uh, when you look at the regulatory requirements out there, uh, you have to do that well before you even get the permit. It's about um, ensuring that you have long-term monitoring in place, um, that you have PNA and emergency response plans in place uh, really before you get that permit so that you're minimizing those risks of, of uh, well bore integrity loss in the future. Great. Well, thank you for that answer. Thank you for the question, of course. I guess one thing you just you just mentioned, uh, regulatory consideration. So I, I'd be remiss not to ask, what are the big differences between you know, store, CO2 storage wells and, uh, you know, more, again, traditional wells for, you know, EOR, enhanced oil recovery? What, from a regulatory standpoint, are there overlap? Are there differences? You know, how, how do those regulatory bodies look at these applications? Uh, and obviously, what are the implications for companies that are planning these wells, Misty? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's really three main differences that pop into my head between um, EOR and CCUS uh, operations or, or um, kind of requirements. Uh, first is around the subsurface selection. So so where you're selecting that, that storage site, the, the purpose of injection, what, what you're doing from an operational standpoint. And the third thing is exactly what you noted is around the regulatory requirements for that design. So if I look at EOR, for example, it's really focused on injecting CO2 into depleted reservoirs um, and then pushing that residual oil and gas to surface. However, in most CCUS operations, CO2 is injected into a saline aquifer, so a little bit different kind of subsurface property and stored under pressure. Uh, if you're sitting here in the U.S., um, EPA guidelines for EOR wells are defined as, as class two, um, and, and there's really little um, or, or less regulatory oversight. As the CCUS market is growing, the regulatory requirements for CCS wells are, have become much, much more stringent in comparison to an EOR. Uh, there's requirements around specialty materials that, that minimize that corrosion effect that I was talking about um, earlier, whether that be on the casing side or on, on the cement side. Uh, and again, uh, as I kind of noted just a second ago, you, you're required to have long-term monitoring plans, PNA, and emergency response plans in place well before you actually receive the permit, permit for, for that well construction and, and more importantly for the injection piece. So I think there's a lot of similarities that we can leverage our experience from oil and gas and, ex and, and enhanced oil recovery and extend to CCUS. But our customers recognize there are differences. And when we look at those differences, we have to be um, aware and cognizant of those differences and make sure we're managing those risks appropriately. Great. Well, thanks for that. And, and I guess uh, well, we have a lot of questions flowing in here, but we have one question that I think goes back to some of the differences in, in types of wells that you addressed earlier in the episode. And in particular, you know, you talked about uh, potential for micro annulus formulation uh, due to, you know, the cycling of, you know, injection, withdrawal, injection, withdrawal. And Jeff asked, all right, given what you mentioned earlier about those concerns, is there a long-term plan to mitigate or correct micro annular leaks, Misty? Is that, is that an option once, you know, once you've already, uh, you know, set forth on this process? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to go back to that. You start at the design, right? So your goal as you're designing your cement slurry is to, one, understand what that uh, those injection operations are going to be from a temperature and pressure standpoint. Select your materials and design your cement to have that elasticity piece. And then you can test that. You know, um, in Halliburton, we have uh, both what we're, we describe as well life additives, which provide in, enhanced elasticity. Obviously, a resin would help that as well. And then we have our well life software that allows us to understand 
um, by, by using in-lab testing for mechanical properties, what these cyclic uh, lifetimes will look like um, on that cement sample. So we can do testing where we add pressure and temperature, release it, add, release that cyclic uh, testing. And then we can take that and actually um, forecast out um, or, or uh, estimate out how long or how many cycles that cement um, would be able to take uh, in these type of injection systems. So the, the key is uh, both understanding what those operations are going to look like uh, to designing uh, your cement system to have enhanced elasticity. And then, of course, testing to make sure you understand what that will look like under the cyclic side. From the second piece of that question around, you know, what do you do with with, uh, with wells that are already out there? Again, I think each well is different and it's unique. Uh, it's a conversation with the customer to understand uh, what their wells have undergone, um, what kind of uh, information uh, they have about the current integrity of that cement, and ultimately whether they're going to have to go in uh, and remediate it or um, or or PNA. I think remediation is is a challenge, uh, especially from an injection well standpoint. I don't think that that's going to be an option in many many cases. Uh, but but uh, you know coming off the uh, Coming off that question, I think the key is just really understand what you have on the front end on a design standpoint and then to on the back end of use it, repurposing or thinking about repurposing wells. Um, what do you know about the well? Um, but more importantly, how much do you not know about that well? Great. And if I might add, because you made this very clear earlier, I think it's going to stick with me for at least the rest of the day. Utilizing best practices, right? Utilizing best practices, utilizing best practices, utilizing best practices and and maybe you won't have to deal with those issues. Uh, all that being said, Misty, we got a lot of questions that uh, flooded our, our uh, chat today, which is great. Unfortunately, we're not going to have any more time to address any specific questions. But are there any final words here before we wrap up? Any final things no. to either address, again, common skepticisms or, or questions that you encounter that you want our audience to know before we sign off today? No, I appreciate the time. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of interest and chatter, um, both here and, and externally. I think you're, you'll are you share my information. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. Uh, you know, it's about a conversation. The CCUS market is evolving, both from, uh, you know, a commercial standpoint and from a technology standpoint. So our goal is to, you know, work with our customers, collaborate early in the process so that we better understand what their goals are and ultimately how we can minimize their risk across that CCUS life cycle. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to chat. All right. Well, it was our pleasure. And again, to our audience, you heard Misty's invitation to collaborate with her. So I think we have her uh, contact information up. We can bring on the screen here. So get a hold of her on LinkedIn, ask your questions, connect, collaborate, uh, keep this conversation going, right? If you're watching this on replay, keep on asking your questions and we'll, we'll keep, uh, keep getting your answers. So that being said, Misty, again, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank you for all the insights you shared about long-term barrier design for carbon capture and storage well construction. And of course, I want to give a special thank you to Halliburton. If you, the audience, would like to watch a replay of this episode, you can do so over on the SPE Energy Stream, the industry digital pulse. Visit streaming.spe.org. I'm your host, Joe Sinnott. Join us again next time right here on SPE Tech Talk. In a rapidly evolving energy industry, you need to stay ahead of the curve with relevant content available when and where it's convenient for you. You need the upgraded SPE Energy Stream, the global platform for high quality content with the energy industry. Fuel your energy career with Energy Stream's sleek new look and easy access to top quality technical solutions, insights and innovations, trending topics, thought leadership, market outlooks, and education. From original programs to exclusive SPE event highlights, this exciting, easy to navigate platform features insightful content delivered live and on demand. Explore insights from industry thought leaders. Then save the videos that interest you and watch them at your convenience. Be at the forefront of energy knowledge and explore the newly updated SPE Energy Stream now.